So, welcome to the second talk of the session. Welcome, um, Nikita. Um, Nick will speak about a library, a Haskell library. Um, he claims it's the fastest Haskell uh, driver for Postgres. Yeah. Let's see. Thank you. Um, so um, I'm one of those Haskellers that actually do Haskell in production. And in my company, we uh, use this library heavily. Uh, it goes through a lot of uh, loads. Uh, so it's, it has some proper testing. Um, about Haskell, uh, there is a problem of naming this library, I mean, pronouncing the name, because uh, it's easily con confusable with Haskell. Uh, I tend to call it Haskell, but I might uh, switch to Haskell at point at some point in time. Uh, so just be prepared for this. Um, it is already known as the fastest fastest driver around in at least in the Haskell ecosystem. Uh, it is known to be at least uh, faster by the factor of two. Uh, than the than the other popular library in the Haskell ecosystem, and that library PostgreSQL symbol is um, is heavily used in a lot of uh, competing projects. Um, Has Haskell uh, uses parametric queries um, compared to uh, PostgreSQL symbol, which does not. Uh, PostgreSQL simple um, injects values uh, directly into SQL, which even sounds like not the best practice, but still uh, it works and people still use it. Uh, and naturally, this uh, using parametric queries uh, gives a performance boost. And uh, another thing that gives a performance boost to Haskell uh, is that it uses the binary format for uh, transferring values to uh, to the database and receiving them. Uh, naturally, binary format is way simpler to parse and to render, so it gives a, a lot of performance boost. Um, another peculiar peculiarity of this library is its mapping API. The approach to, uh, taken to it. Um, most of other projects, they tend to uh, make mapping of values uh, implicit, but in case of Haskell, we make it absolutely explicit and you can compose them, you can pick directly which kind of uh, codec you want to use. And this, uh, another property of this approach is that uh, it allows you, allows us to uh, be very granular about all those uh, Abstractions used for uh, mapping of values and being granular allows us to use uh, proper category theory abstractions for composition. Um, in the end, it turns out to be layers of uh, abstractions used in, in the uh, in the library, and one abstraction uh, executes the other. It's like layers. Uh, one well, one is bound into the other. Um, it, it goes around throughout the whole library. And it actually, despite sounding uh, weird, maybe not, not that uh, frequent uh, as a practice, it turns out to be a very efficient approach and it makes the API terribly simple. Um, as an example, uh, you can see here a simple query uh, which produces uh, a set of results uh, with the name and birthday, and uh, below it you can see a Haskell type that you would expect it to um, to be uh, the results to be converted into. So this is uh, a clearly isolated problem: choosing which types to use for the values in the row. Another uh, clearly se uh, separatable problem is. Uh, the choice of packing, uh, the choice of which data structure we use to pack the, the uh, rows. Obviously, in this case, maybe uh, is 
is a better choice. Another case is uh, that some results <coughs> might be just directly integer values, as in this case. Um, so the approach taken by this library uh, has this intuition. Um, the result of that is that every abstraction introduced uh, has its own set of proper category theory type class instances and composes neatly. It just does that well. And the problem with most other libraries is that uh, the authors tend to have a very wrong intuition about it. They decide whether something is worth um, isol uh, being isolated based on the subjective size of the problem. But it's not the size that makes things uh, decomposable, it is the problem area. If you have something clearly doing uh, with another, uh, dealing with another subject, you should isolate it into another uh, abstraction, even despite that that abstraction might have just a single operation. It is still worth it. And this is why uh, we are really used to um, uh, real world applications not having much to do with category theory at all and not being composable all that much. This is the reason, because people tend to not decompose enough. Um, the new version of HasQL, the things that uh, I've mentioned so far they uh, concern the older version of the library and also the newer version because the API does not change that drastically. Um, but uh, uh, this new version is still uh, in the works. There are issues uh, still to be fixed there. Um, it's going through performance optimizations, profiling, benchmarking and all this. Tough business, basically. But uh, the library is uh, the new version gets gets close to the release, um, and the core functionality is already implemented in the new version, and uh, it is implemented at least enough to prove that it works the way it should. Um, because I I need to distribute this uh, newer newer version um, for people just to be able to play around with it I mean like maybe today you would want to play around with it to see the features I had to come up with a certain scheme of releases and um, the, this sort of weird approach to versioning um, actually solves uh, uh, a good uh, uh, um, a large problem when you release something newer and you're not certain about it you, it is an, in sort of an experimental chip state people uh, are scared of making such releases but uh, using this uh, scheme allows me uh, to be just uh, deploying all, all the time any change I introduce into the library I can make a release so basically all the newer uh, experimental versions, they live in the z zero prefect space, but the stable version uh, lives in the uh, one prefect space. Once I finish the newer version, it's gonna go into the uh, two prefect uh, space. So what's new? Uh, why would I wanna change anything in a library that is <coughs> Uh, already proven to be uh, well having the leading position in the, on the market if you can say so um, to answer that let's cover a few facts about Postgres first of all it is the default SQL database as probably most of you already know uh, it is the de facto choice and it's fast it's featureful it's typed and it's supported by all kinds of services uh, including Amazon um, another fact is that uh, Postgres is distributed with uh, a C library, uh, which is basically a low-level API used by the majority of uh, drivers in all sorts of 
languages, not just Haskell. Um, and that library is not only low level, it is also low quality. Um, I'm not just saying that, there are some bad design decisions made in this library, which I'm gonna explain soon. Um, but this means that Haskell gets an opportunity to beat VP2. Haskell can beat C. And th this project is there to prove it. And it's, just, it's not just a hypothesis, it's already proven. In some of the benchmarks, HasQL performs better than LibPQ by an exponential factor. This is because, because of the design decisions, and I'm going to show it to you soon. So what's wrong in, uh, about LibPQ? First of all, it does not let you start processing the result while you're still receiving it. Imagine fetching a result of thousands of rows you will have to first fetch it all into your memory, allocate it, and only after that can, will you be able to start processing it. Now imagine fetching a million of rows. This is clearly a problem. And only recently have the authors of the PQ introduced a workaround for that, but that workaround actually works slower than a version without it. Another issue with that is that LibPQ does not support pipelining. What pipelining is, uh, is shown at this picture. Sorry. So this slide compares two models of communication between the client and the server. Uh, to the left, you can see a synchronous model uh, where the client always uh, waits for the server to respond before issuing in issuing a new request. And to the right, you can see an asynchronous uh, model or pipelining model uh, where the client keeps sending the requests um, even without uh, receiving the results yet. So it doesn't have to wait block or block waiting for the server. And even on this slide, you can easily see that the asynchronous model is consumed, consumes less of time. So uh, this is an opportunity because LibPQ does not support pipelining, but protocol does. The protocol used for the communication with the server allows us to do pipelining. And basically those two issues are the reason why um, I decided to re-implement HasQL uh, based on the binary protocol directly. So it directly implements the binary protocol. And it does not depend on LibPQ. So by getting rid of this um, dependency, I'm also getting rid of all the constraints that come with it. And so new HasQL supports streaming, re result processing, and it does support pipelining. And now let me give you a bird's eye view on the API. Um, please notice that it didn't change drastically, so most of the concepts that I'm going to be covering right now uh, will, apply, will also apply to the older version which is distributed as number one. So please just relax and absorb. First we have uh, IO with the whole universe of the operations that you can perform in it, and we yet uh, a few new ones to it. Open a connection to the database, close it, and execute some abstraction named session. So, in other words, this library only lets you do three things in I.O. The rest is done in, in, within the abstractions. So, then comes session, and session is an abstraction of the connection or the communication error, basically the cases when you lost the connection or have done something wrong, like didn't consider a proper schema, something like that. Um, you can think of it as, as of such a transformer stack, but it's under the hood, under the hood it is different. 
a session is a moment. Uh, and it lets you compose sequentially. So basically having those two definitions, uh, being a monad allows you to create another def definition from those two. Uh, and as you can see, first we uh, fetch ID by timestamp, and then we fetch something based on that ID. Also notice that this code does not deal with connections at all, and it doesn't deal with errors at all. This is because we are abstracted away from them. A session can execute batch, and this is the only operation that it supports. And batch is an abstraction over the pipeline. So, Yes, that same, same pipelining that LibreQ does not support. And batch is an applicative functor. And why, what for, why not a monad then, um, you might ask. But uh, the, re the reason is that applicative functors basically just let us com compose things uh, in parallel. And here I'll have to diverge a little bit to explain uh, this in detail. So let's compare uh, monads with, with applicative functors. And this is actually a tough subject because a lot of people struggle to understand it. And I know this because I've been there myself. Uh, and I think the reason is that people rarely get, uh, uh, rarely get the introduction with the purpose of those uh, abstractions and which problems they solve. And basically, what Monad does is just provides sequential composition, and that's it. Um, and what do you think the applicative functor does? Parallel composition. Um, so let's look back at the pipelining feature now. Um, in the second case, the, when, when the request is issued, um, the result is still not received. And the, you can see send query one we, and send query two. And when we send, send the query two, we still haven't yet, uh, we still haven't received the result one. Um, this means that basically we cannot use uh, sequential composition here. In other words, to the left you can see a monad, and to the right you can see uh, an applicative function. So batch is an applicative function. And here is how you can use, use that property. So having two for instance, two functions uh, implemented as batches, uh, we can compose them using the applicative functor functions. And this is all you need to execute two things as a batch to utilize pipelining. Just imagine what you would have to do, uh, you would have had to do in C or other languages. And here is another example how, of how you can use applicative functors. Uh, because applicative functors is a functor is not just the type class instance. It comes packed with lots of uh, combinational functions, like traverse for the, uh, as in this example. Um, and using just a single function, you can uh, now make your a simpler function execute in pipelining uh, over lists of values. And you, uh, of course, you, uh, in production, maybe you would uh, consider rewriting your query to work um, on, on lists of values. And probably this would be um, faster. Well, not probably, it's definitely going to be faster. But the difference now is that. 
uh, the uh, using the pipeline, the difference will be just about a little overhead. Before, without pipelining, the difference would be exponential. So basically, you can just let it go and deploy this kind of code into production easily. And what Batch can do, and all that it can do, is execute statements. And probably you've noticed that we already have two abstractions. And they are that simple that they only do one thing. A question then rises, then well, why not just squash them together? And that's the whole point. This kind of granular, granular uh, isolation is the thing that lets us utilize the standard Haskell abstractions. As a result of that, I don't have to invent my own operations for composition. I just use the standard ones. And statement is an abstraction over a statement. It is defined as a uh, type which receives contravariant parameter named params and a covariant. The result um, and absolutely any database query can be um, defined using statement. Select, insert, create, table, create database, anything. And statement is a pro functor. And being a pro functor, it gives us these operations. We can map over the parameters and we can map over the result. And statement consists of an SQL text, basically the specification of the SQL you want to execute, um, a specification of how to convert Haskell values into the Postgres uh, values, basically how to convert them into the Postgres binary format, but you don't have to deal with that. Um, and a results decoder the specification of how you want the results received from the query uh, transformed into Haskell values. And statement can be prepared and not. And for those who don't know what a prepared statement is, it's basically uh, a mechanism which lets you send the uh, SQL just once and on, uh, let the uh, database parse it and keep it somewhere in its local cache, and after that you'll be just calling it by some identifier. It's, well, it's a simple uh, optimization, but you, uh, but there are cases where you might not want to use it, like for instance if you generate your SQL. And now we're getting to the bottom of this. Uh, actually, there are a few layers of abstractions left, but I'm gonna touch them later. For now, let's see some code. And this is an example of a statement. A statement which gives us a name and a birthday by some surname and after a date. So, uh, as the parameters, you can see that the surname would be the text in the first parameter. And the after a day, the day would be the day and vector of text and day would be the results. And you, you define it using uh, that function and then you specify what each of those parameters means. Uh, SQL is just a simple SQL which contains placeholders. You can see two placeholders according to the Postgres syntax, uh, number one and number two. And then comes a parameter encoder. It uses a contravariant functor interface, actually not just a functor, but a divisible functor. And this is a standard function which uh, takes two uh, contravariant functors and squashes them together and makes them work over a tuple. Here is the specification of how those uh, smaller pieces look. Uh, first, the surname, it says that uh, I'm giving you a parameter, which is a primitive, which is a text. 
the, uh, the next one says a parameter primitive date. That simple. But it might look to you that it's a lot of text. Some people might say that it's boilerplate, but actually this is just specification. You are just explicitly saying uh, what needs to be done. And then there comes the results decoder. And here I'm using uh, a function from Gabriel Gonzalez's Foldal library, uh, Foldal vector. And the decode results uh, fold rows allows you to execute such fold and then specify what you want done for each row. So we are folding over all rows received uh, in this query. And I'm sorry for that. Um, here you can see the specification of uh, row decoder and again this is an applicative factor, uh, it's that simple. But the thing that is not uh, easily spotable here is that this API allows us to process the results while still receiving them. So the server is going to be sending for instance millions of rows to us. But while still receiving them, we, we are going to be making steps of default. We can, for instance, simply count all the rows like this, but uh, clearly this is not a wise operation. But there, there could be some better cases like complex folds, which do analytics, statistics, grouping, or whatever. And then there are other layers of abstractions, which are basically encoders. Um, those are all country variant and some are divisible. Those allow you to, well, well basically encode params. One executes the other, it's like this. And decoders are all covariant and some of them are applicative. A uh, dependency graph of everything happening in this library can look like this. Uh, in I.O. we execute sessions, in sessions we execute batches, in batches we execute statements, and statements are defined as a, as a product of SQL encode, encoder and decoder. And the encoder can be an encoder of a primitive value as a text, integer, boolean, float, uh, or an array or a composite type. And an encoder of array can also contain primitive values, a deeper array, or again a composite type. And the decoder can de uh, decode the row, and the row would be specified using either primitive array comp and again composite type. So basically you can see here that everything is possible. Every feature of Postgres is covered by this. And it's all composable. It is all functors, applicative functors, everything from the category theory. And think of this, uh, it, under the hood does a lot of uh, stateful things. It deals with the, with the whole protocol, for Christ's sake. And still, it's all just algebraic things that we're looking at here. It's highly production, see, uh, it's highly production ori oriented, but it's, uh, it looks like we are doing with some pure stuff. So every aspect gets an abstraction. Each abstraction is very simple. Everything is tied to the category theory and no custom combinators are used and no custom type classes are introduced. And um, basically this brought me uh, to a sort of epiphany um, that um, the API is really simple and to make it simple, you just gotta divide the the problem into two basic, two basic sub-problems and one of them would be at the main problem 
the thing that your application actually solves or your library actually solves the, in this case would be in case of HasQL that would be dealing with the database with connections, errors, mapping, all that. And then there is uh, a combinational problem the uh, I mean combining components together le letting you uh, squeeze things together or break them apart and for that part, that part is clearly uh, perfectly covered by a category theory. So uh, my recipe is just make a project only work, on, uh, only deal with the domain problem and move, uh, use category theory for composition. Another thing, um, a short, uh, uh, short introduction uh, into an extension library which abstracts over transactions with the database. It provides uh, an abstraction which is very similar to SCM. Um, it, it works like this. If you execute two concurrent transactions and a conflict arises, one of them is rejected and then automatically retried by this, uh, this uh, abstraction. So you don't have to deal with exceptions there or retrying logic. And transaction has a very similar graph of dependencies. It, um, it executes batch and session executes transaction. I've missed transaction between session and batch. It was supposed to be there. Sorry for that. And Basically, it looks like that. So the batch can be executed both in session and in transaction now. And project status is that uh, the stable version, which is released as one point something, uh, is battle tested. Um, it is already the fastest Haskell driver, and the newer version will be even faster. Um, uh, it has a lot of active users, it has 200 stars on GitHub, and it stands behind Postgres, uh, the project which has 10k stars on GitHub. It, it is a really popular project. So basically, this wraps up. Thank you. That would be a, a bad decision because it's going to introduce a lot of overhead. I'm dealing with pointers directly there. I'm using buffers and all this low level stuff. I think that there will be a factor actually, okay. at least two. But I haven't measured, but it's gone, definitely going to be. that but yeah the the logic behind that it seems to be very comparable it's like using applicable <coughs> functors to specify parallelism basically yeah. or asynchronicity as in this case but this is just generally a property of uh, applicative functors like for instance even Simon has his in his uh, async library he has an abstraction <coughs> called concurrently and all it does is just com composes things using applicative functor <coughs> it's weird if you're done concurrently. <coughs> Any other questions? More questions? Yeah. I was wondering about how do you hide the errors? How do you the errors? Well, they are covered within session or within other uh, abstractions. In the end, when you execute the session, you get the, either the result <coughs> or an error. So basically like that. Uh, I don't do not use exceptions <coughs> in any project. And uh, right, these encoders and decoders, do they not just be generic? Generic as in, as in, as in, as in they could be uh, it could be done 
externally in another library if you want to. I just the purpose of this project is to provide all the tools you need to make a performing project. And uh, about that, you can implement DSLs or whatever kind of abstractions. This is a sort of a low-level uh, driver with some good uh, abstractions, but it still can be abstracted over. So I think you said the session that the type is more or less the reality of connection of uh, reality of IO, but you said it's actually different what we have. Why, why did you have something different, and why, what is it? Uh, different for that. From, you said it's conceptually a redirty of connection oh, right. of redirty of I.O. Yeah. You said we have something different, so why, and what, what is it? Well, the, there is a lot of things happening there. Um, I mean, uh, there is uh, a channel of messages and all these kind of things happening there. Um, I'm not sure whether using reader there would be a good fit. Um, maybe I don't even remember what I'm using there because <laughs> there's so many things happening, but probably there is a good reason. To <laughs> Sorry for that. Um, with this version, the, the one you're doing now, or the previous version, is there any other library or project building like a higher level interface on top of it? Does on top of HasGL? Yeah, that you know. Um, I don't know any, but. Uh, th th there's definitely going to be a project of mine, which I have scheduled. Uh, it's going to be a quasi quarter which will automatically uh, check the correctness of the query and automatically derive, well, at least let you somehow deal with the, uh, with the placeholders that you have there. It's going and definitely it's going to reduce the clutter. More questions? I couldn't have covered it all. I, have, I still have one question about simplicity. If, if I don't really care about performance, so I have a small database, and then, then all I care about is I want to have really a convenient library. I want to, to write my SQL queries and parameters and then get a, probably get back a list of results. Would you recommend a library for this kind of approach? I mean, the, the code you showed was, was not really difficult, but I think it's more than you would need with in such a simple situation? Um, I don't know any such library uh, which uses HasQL, but there are DSLs and there are other libraries which take a higher level abstraction. Okay. I never used them, so I cannot re recommend any. For obvious reasons, I used a, a, a different library. But um, from the perspective of uh, simplicity, it is really actually it is really a good practice to just have those statements defined in some module and you forget about them. Once you write them, you just write them once. And after that, you can operate on those higher level abstractions which compose them together in different shapes. So it's really not a problem, as it turns out. Uh, oh, sorry, one more question about streaming. So, um, so you're using streaming and you're allow uh, users to use a fold to fold over that screen. Yeah. Would it be useful to expose a streaming interface on top of the, the execution so that you get back a conduit or pipes or whatever? I, I, I understand your question, but I couldn't find any useful case for that so far. So uh, my approach is take the, uh, the simpler abstraction whenever you can, uh, unless you have a motivation, to a, a proper motivation not to. This is why I'm using fold there. But there are standard, uh, other standard uh, decoders which automatically transform into vector and do that more efficiently than through folding and things like that. Okay, good. I guess that's no more it. questions? Then, thank you again. Thank you very much.